Well, uh, for those of you who finally feel like you have mastered understanding my accent, uh, I got a call this week, so I just wanted to keep you on your toes, challenge you to further understand me. Uh, I wanted to ask this morning, how many of you can remember a time uh, when you were growing up or, or even now where you had something happen or you did something that you didn't want to tell your parents about? You didn't want them to find out about it. There's probably some middle schoolers in the room right now that are like, yeah, that actually happened last night. Um, but all of us have that experience, right? We all have this experience where one day or another, something happens, we make some choice, uh, something terrible happens, and we don't want our parents to find out about it. I can remember a specific time in my life uh, when I was younger, maybe about nine or 10 at that age where you're making lots of stupid decisions. And uh, I was digging around in my dad's toolbox in the garage because I had nothing better to do. Uh, and uh, I find this fist-sized magnet in there, this really big magnet. And so I did what any responsible nine or 10-year-old kid would do. I go and test all the things in the house that might be magnetic. So I go inside, I'm going around everything, I'm putting it on everything I can find that has even a tiny little bit of metal. And then I go in the living room and I see the TV. And I think, ooh, the TV might be magnetic. Uh, and I don't know why, but I was thinking in this moment that I'm about to make some huge like discovery in physics. This is gonna be magnificent. So I go up, uh, and this is one of those old school TVs. So it's not like the TVs we have now. It was one of the really big ones that has a, a vacuum tube inside. And the, it's, it's like an antique these days, which is incredible to admit. But uh, what it has in there, the way the picture works is it has this electron beam. Now, electrons are affected by magnets. So I go over there and it's got the picture going on, the news is going, my mom is somewhere else, uh, and I put my big fist size magnet right in the middle of the screen and everything goes shunk and just goes straight into the middle. And so immediately I'm like, oh, what just happened? And I, I pull the magnet off and there's this tiny beam of light and the whole picture has been sucked into where the magnet is. So I'm freaking out because I'm like, oh, I've just broke the TV and this is expensive, I'm gonna be in trouble, I'm probably gonna be killed. So I'm quickly thinking about what I can do to fix this situation, so I'm moving the magnet all around the screen, <laughs> the light's going up and down, you know, it's like a heart monitor, but I can't get this thing to come back on, and I, I start turning this TV on and off, and the only thing I can think in that moment is, I really hope that my parents don't find out about this. <laughs> if they find out that I've ruined the TV, then that's, that's gonna be it for me for life. And I, I had no idea what to do. The thing that was most important to me, I wasn't even thinking about fixing the TV, I was just thinking about I can't have my parents know about this. Now thankfully, after a few thousand on and offs, the picture started to come back. So I just casually whistled away and was like, oh, that's weird, the TV's a different color, I didn't do that. <laughs> but thankfully, nothing happened. Now, I'm sure that you can remember a similar occasion in your life where something happened like that, you did something, or involved in a situation where you felt like you couldn't come near to your parents. And that's actually the way a lot of us feel about God. Even if we are not a Christian, we think of God as this angry old man in the sky that's looking for a reason to get us, that he's looking for a reason to point out what we did wrong, to become upset with us, to tell us how much of a disappointment we are. And this morning in Hebrews, we are reading a passage that kind of hits back against the idea. Because God knows that we think of him this way, God knows that we feel of him this way, and he wants to correct that, he wants us to help, he wants to help us view him rightly. So we're gonna go ahead and read a passage, and, and as we do that, I wanna remind you about what this book is about in general. So if you are new with us, we're in week six of a series looking at the letter of Hebrews, which is in the New Testament. Uh, it was written about a few decades after Jesus had lived, towards the end of that century. Uh, not too long, and so some of the people who had walked with Jesus were still alive. Uh, and this letter comes to a group of Christians who are experiencing some hardship. To be a Christian at this time in history and at this part of the world was not a good idea. Uh, the government was after you, the Roman authorities, they were coming after you. Uh, the Jewish authorities didn't like you either, and so some Christians were even being put to death. And so the Hebrew community, the people who get this letter for the first time, they're struggling with their belief in Jesus, with following Jesus because they're worried that they might not be worth it. They're seeing friends that they love, seeing people that they care about lose their lives and go through extreme hardship because of what they believe. And in the midst of that, we get this author who we don't know their name, but he writes them this letter and says, guys, Jesus is greater than what you are facing right now. Who Jesus is and what he has done, everything about him is all you need to be able to weather this storm. He is better than having comfort. He's better than having your security. He's better than having all of the things that you feel you're losing right now. Remember who he is. 
And as we go through this, there's two things that have stuck out to me as I've studied it that I want to remind us of as a church. And that's, first of all, that theology matters. What I mean by that is that the things that we see about God, the things that we believe about who he is, make a difference in our lives. Hebrews is one of my very favorite books in the Bible, but it is very difficult to understand because there's a lot of these really big words, these big theological ideas, and most of us who are not uh, professional theologians can have a hard time with them. But I wanna, wanna, what I want to encourage you in is that we need to try and understand these things. We want to wrestle with them because if we can understand what God is telling us about himself, it will make a difference in our lives. The person who wrote this letter wasn't trying to just give the Hebrews some information so that when someone asked them about their religion, they could answer back with a really clever answer. He was trying to give them something that they could actually hold on to, that could make a real practical difference in their suffering. And that's the same thing that's true for us today. If we wrestle with this and we understand it, it can make a difference in our lives. The second thing is that we all need someone that's bigger than ourselves. We all need someone that's greater than us. See, these people were going through extremely difficult things, things that probably most of us in this room can't imagine what it's like to go through. Certainly as a Christian, we don't face any of the, the persecution that they did. To be a Christian in America today is, is pretty easy. But we still need someone bigger than us. Even if it's not the exact same circumstances, there's still things in our lives that we feel overwhelm us, things that we feel are too much to handle on our own and we need something bigger than us. That's why human beings chase religion, it's why we chase charismatic leaders, it's why we chase big ideas because we are constantly looking for something bigger than ourselves to deal with what we face in this world. And both of those things are so important in the passage we're gonna read today because they're right at the heart of it. This idea that who God is and what he's done, everything about that makes a real difference in our lives. And second of all, God is bigger than us. And that's good news. Jesus is greater than us. That's why this series is called Jesus is Greater because that's good news. So go ahead, read with me. We're in chapter four of Hebrews, verses 14 through 16. This is what it says. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the start of this passage, we're told something we've actually already heard in Hebrews, which is Jesus is our great high priest. Uh, that's something that we heard way back in chapter two. It said in, in verse 17 of chapter two that Jesus became like us so that he could be a faithful high priest. Now, I think we can have some trouble as we move very quickly through Hebrews, really even understanding what it is to be a priest. So I wanna give us a, a little bit of a quick insight into this. Uh, what, what the author is saying by saying that Jesus is a faithful high priest, that he is our great high priest, is he's saying two things. First of all, Jesus is our representative because that's what a priest was. A priest to these people was someone who could represent them before God, who could stand in for them, who could pray for them, who could uh, go before God and make petition for them. And then the second thing is that a priest was there to try and deal with the problem of sin. So when people knew that they hadn't quite lived up to the way they should be living, when they had mistakes in their life, when they had struggles in their life, they could go to a priest and the priest would help absolve them of that. The priest would go in and make sacrifice for them. And so that's the two things that the author of Hebrews is telling us about Jesus. He is someone who can represent us and he's someone who can deal with the problem of sin. Now, I wanna give you guys an analogy to maybe better understand this because if there's one thing that is as mysterious and confusing as religion, it's British politics. So I wanted to give you an insight and help you understand a little bit about how the prime minister relates to the queen. Uh, now, if you are confused about that, you are in the same boat as 90% of the British population. We have no idea why we have a queen at all. Uh, we, we just know that she's there and she's kind of the ruler of the country, but then the prime minister does a lot of stuff. And so I, I've, in the past, I've read into this to try and understand why, why do we have both. Now the prime minister, the way he started historically is he was meant to be a representative of the people to the queen. He was meant to be her senior most advisor. So that's why he's called the prime minister. He was her prime advisor, her most senior advisor. And so he would come in and represent the ideas and, and what's going on amongst most of the country. Now obviously our 
political system has evolved a little bit, so it's not exactly like that, but that's what the prime minister is supposed to be. That's what he's supposed to function as. That's why he's elected, because he's a representative of the people. He's someone who is meant to represent the majority views, who could enact laws for the majority and, and make petition to the queen for those laws. He actually has a, a weekly meeting with the queen where he'll sit down and talk about everything that's going on. So in the first instance, the prime minister is kind of like a priest in that he is a representative of the people. Now, the second thing the prime minister does is he has to bring all of those laws and things that his political party is putting together, and he has to advocate for them. He has to talk with the queen. He has to talk with other leaders about why he thinks they're a good idea. And he has to come up with things that can help address the problems in society. That's what he is supposed to do, come up with laws that can help deal with situations in society, the same as any political leader. And so again, in the same way, he's a little bit like a priest in that he is meant to advocate for people. He's meant to come up with things that will best address the problems in society. Now that, that is kind of, again, what Jesus is doing. That's why this role is so important. It's not just that uh, we're being told that Jesus is a religious person who makes prayers for us, who does things. He's actually an important senior official who can represent us before the most important throne in the universe, which is the throne of God. He's not just a prime minister going to a king or a queen. He is a high priest who is going before God himself to represent us, to advocate for us, to, to pray for us, to talk with God about the things that we need. The Bible actually tells us repeatedly that Jesus even now is in heaven praying for us. He is our high priest who advocates for us, who asks God to give us grace, who asks God to provide for us, to care for us. That's who Jesus is. And he's not only that, but he is the one that God gave us to deal with the most important problem that we all face, which is the problem of sin. It's a very religious word, but I think even people outside of church can relate to the idea of what that is, which is that we all know we don't measure up. We all of us know that we are not the best people that we could be. We all know that the real problems we face in the world, racism, sexism, cruelty, all of those things come from people. We know there's something wrong with people. And so Jesus is God's answer to those problems. He is the high priest who is coming to do something about those problems, specifically about the problem of sin. And he's, he's a greater priest than anyone who has ever lived because what we're told in this passage is that Jesus is our high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now, for the people reading this letter, they would understand what a priest would do in order to fulfill his role as he would enter into a very special sacred place in the temple called the Holy of Holies. It was the place furthest back inside the temple where they would store the Ark of the Covenant and the, the priest would go in there and pray for the people. Now only the high priest could go into that place. No one else could go in there. It was a dangerous place. It was, it was very well accepted that only the high priest had the right to go into that place. Only he, as the representative for God, could go into that room. Now Jesus has gone, done something far better than just going into some sacred room. Jesus has passed through the heavens he hasn't just gone into a sacred space to try and offer something to God. He's went to the very throne of God itself. That's where, God, where Jesus makes his intercession for us before God's very throne, before his feet. That's where Jesus is praying for us right now. That's where Jesus goes. He didn't just pass through into the Holy of Holies. He passed through the heavens itself. Now, this is one of those moments where we're talking about some really cool theology that sounds interesting, that sounds incredible, but I wanna help you understand this makes a real difference. If that's who Jesus is, if he is this high priest who goes all the way before God's very throne, if he passes through the heavens, then he is someone that we can really hold on to, who can actually make a difference. That's why the author goes on to say that because he is this high priest who's passed through the heavens, then we should hold fast to him. He uses this Greek word, kriteo, which means to cling to tenaciously. This idea of gripping with all of your strength to Jesus because he is worth holding on to. Imagine being in the midst of a storm and there's chaos going around you. You want to hold on to something that can keep you solid, that can keep you firm so that you're not going to get tossed away. You're not going to get pulled away in the wind. That's who Jesus is. He's someone we can cling to because he has really gone all the way to God's throne. He has done what no one else can do because he is the only one in history, who could be the true representative of us before God. No one else can do what he's done. Only he is uniquely qualified to do that. Only he can be that high priest. Now we still have a little bit of a problem because even though we can accept that maybe this is who he is, we don't have much confidence going to Jesus usually, or at least I don't. I can be honest with you, I, sometimes I get nervous about bringing my problems to Jesus 
Because deep down, I struggle with what we talked about at the start, which is this feeling of, of thinking I couldn't possibly go to him. I couldn't possibly bring my issues and my problems before God because he's gonna be either disappointed in me or he's gonna be angry with me. And if we're honest, most of us, even those of us who've grown up in church, can struggle with that feeling an awful lot. We feel like God does not want to listen to us. We feel like if we go before God and we, we deal with the things that are going on in our life, we share with him the mistakes that we've made, that God is just going to point his finger at us and say, how could you possibly do that? Why did you do that? You've let me down. That's the way we think about God most often. Now, why do we do that? Because the Bible seems to tell us again and again that Jesus is there to help us. Why is it that we think of Jesus or we think of God as someone who doesn't want us to come to him in our moments of need, who doesn't want us to confess our sin to him? I think it's because we believe two lies. We first of all believe that God doesn't understand us. He doesn't understand what we're going through. And so he won't have any sympathy towards us. And the second thing is we don't believe that he really can do anything about it that all of this is just kind of religious mumbo jumbo and there's nothing that actually can be done about the mistakes that we've made. And both of those things are lies. There's probably a time you can remember in your life where you have gone through something that was very, very difficult and painful and challenging and exposing uh, to where you felt your weakness has come out. And, and there's two things that you want in that moment. You want someone who understands you, who knows what you're going through, who can offer you comfort, and you want someone who can help you get through it, someone who could do something about that. Now, if you remember at the end of last week's sermon, we were talking about how Jesus, the word of God, exposes us. He exposes our weaknesses, that when we come, come before him, verse 13 tells us that we're naked and exposed. That all of us, he sees everything going on in our life. And that's just like those moments in our life where we find uh, things coming to the service that we don't know what to do with it. We feel afraid, we feel anxious, we feel nervous. Just like in my story, we don't want to go to our parental figures or, or authority figures because we think that they're not going to help us. Well, one time in my life where I experienced that in particular is when I became a parent for the first time. And if you're a parent, you can probably associate to this because when you become a parent with your first child, you have never experienced anything like it. It is quite the uh, challenge to go through. And, and you, you're caught up in the euphoria of it when you first have the baby, but then you go home and all of a sudden the baby's crying all night long. And the first three days you're like, oh, it's okay, I love them. And by day four or five, you're like, I hate you, get out of my house. <laughs> and you really have a hard time with it, and all of a sudden you realize that you're not quite as selfless as you thought you were. You're not quite as patient as you thought you were. You are not necessarily the good person and the great parent that you envisioned yourself being because that child and the challenge of all of a sudden having to care for this human being that can't care for themselves, it exposes you. It exposes the weaknesses, just like we talked about last week. All those things about you that you struggle with, that you maybe feel a little bit of guilt about or a weakness about, they come to the surface. And maybe it's not parenting for you. Maybe it's managing your finances. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's friendships and relationships with people in your family. There's always something in our lives that draws out our weaknesses. And in those times, we want someone who can sympathize with us and someone who can help us. Now, one particular time I remember with my son, my oldest son, Jonathan, where that happened for me, where I got someone who could understand and someone who could help me, was actually not too long ago earlier this year. Uh, Jonathan, uh, my oldest son, he's two and a half now, uh, he developed this, uh, this thing where if he really loved you, the way he would show you his love is to try and bite your fingers off. Um, and so he was going around when we were playgrounds trying to bite the fingers off the population of St. Charles in Geneva. And so we became really anxious about this because we would put him in time out, we would do lots of different things to try and help him, but nothing we, do, we did would turn things around. We didn't know what to do. We didn't want to be too cruel because he's only a two and a half year old, he doesn't fully understand, so there's only so much you can do there. But we didn't want to leave it because we didn't want him to get into this habit of hurting other kids and other people. So we didn't know what to do. Now we had some friends come along who their child had been through the exact same thing. And they encouraged us and they had really good things to say and they had help and advice to give us. And it felt so good to know that someone else had been through what we had been through, that we weren't bad parents, that we weren't terrible people. This is something that everyone goes through. And we had someone to tell us that that was the case. We had someone who understood, who could sympathize. And not only that, because they had gone through it, they could give us help. They could help us get out of that situation. So that's what they did. They gave us advice on, on how to get out of that. Now Jesus has actually done the same thing, but he's done it to an even greater degree because Jesus became one of us so that he could sympathize, so that he could understand what we go through. 
He became a man. If, if you remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. Jesus was fully man. He got tired. He got sick. He struggled with anxiety. He was afraid. He was lonely. He was betrayed by his friends. I mean, we could stand here all day and talk about the difficult things that Jesus went through that we all go through. He wasn't immune to pain and suffering. He wasn't immune to the challenges that we all face as people. He went through all of those things and he did it so that he could understand it. So that when we go through things and we call on God, he doesn't say to us, how could you possibly be tempted by that? He says, I understand what it's like to be tempted by that. I understand what it's like to go through difficult, painful circumstances and try and find your joy in something other than in God. He understands it. Now he doesn't just stop there, he doesn't just understand it, but he, he tells us that he can do something about it. See, Jesus was tempted just like we are, but there's one difference, he didn't sin. Jesus didn't give in to lust, he didn't break to selfishness, he didn't give in to his impulse desires to be worse, to be cruel. Every time he was tempted, he stood firm, and he said, no, I'm gonna find my joy in God, I'm gonna love people, and I'm gonna love God. That's what Jesus did. There was not one moment in his life where he chose to give in to temptation. Now we shouldn't look at that and feel shame and guilt. That's not there so Jesus can say, see, I did it and you didn't. It's there so that Jesus can say, because you didn't, I did. Because you couldn't, I will. That's what Jesus is saying when we are told that he's our great priest who sympathizes with us, who was tempted like us but didn't sin. God is saying, Jesus is doing what you can't do on your own. Jesus is doing for you what you could not do. So Jesus isn't just a, a self-help guru who can give us advice on getting out of situations that are difficult. Jesus is a victorious God who faces sin for us so that when we are tempted, it doesn't rest on us being able to be good enough in that moment, it rests on Jesus. That's why we should have a greater confidence with Jesus because he has done what we could not do for ourselves. He has fought the battle that we couldn't fight. Now that's not all Jesus did as our high priest. The last verse in this section, verse 16, says this. It says that we can boldly approach the throne of grace so that we can find help in time of need. With confidence, let's draw near to God. That's what the author of Hebrews is saying. Now, for the people reading this letter, this is, is water in the desert because these people are going through really, really difficult times and they did not think that they could go to God. They, they'd had it drilled into them since they were kids that if they wanted God's help, then someone had to go to God on their behalf for them because they couldn't possibly do it. They grew up reading stories in the Bible about people who couldn't go into the Holy of Holies because if they got anywhere near the Ark of the Covenant, which is the symbol of God's presence, that they would die. There's actually a story in the Old Testament where they're carrying the Ark of, Covenant, of the Covenant, which is a, a symbol of God's presence again, and someone touches it and they immediately fall down dead. That's the idea of, of God that they had, that he was so holy that they couldn't go anywhere near him. And now all of a sudden someone is telling them, no, you can draw near to God. You don't have to be afraid. He wants you to come to the throne of grace. He wants you to come near to him in your time of need. If you've gone to a foreign country and you've gone through immigration, then you know the, the pain and the hell of going through immigration. It is an unpleasant process, especially for me when I first moved to the United States before I got my green card, I would have to stand in a line where it would take twice as long as any of the others. Because the idea with immigration is, is that there are restrictions, there are uh, processes that you've got to go through in order to get in. You can't draw near and get inside of the United States until you've passed through all of those checkpoints. And you can stand there and get so bored and so tired while you're waiting to try and make it through. And it's intimidating, there are people with guns, there are people whose job it is specifically to keep you out. Now compare that to when you're home with your family. For most of us, when we are home with family, there are no restrictions, there are no barriers between us and the people that we love. There's no uh, hoops that we've got to jump through to be close to, the, to our parents or our kids or our siblings. We just get to be there with them. I told you a story about what's difficult parenting Ali with Jonathan, but one of the, the greatest joys I have a parent that outweighs any challenge I face is the fact that when I come home from work, he runs straight up to me. My son has absolutely no fear being close to me, and I hope he never ever loses that, because a lot of us do. 
A lot, a lot of us grow up and feel like we can't be close to our parents, we can't tell them everything that's going on inside, we can't be near them in moments of need, we've got to work it out ourselves. And I hope my son never loses that because that is what God wants us to be like. That's why Jesus, when he was teaching, said, let the little children come to me for theirs is the kingdom of God. He's saying, be like them, come up to me when you need me, don't feel like there's any restrictions between us, don't feel like there's barriers, be like the children that come straight up to me. That's what God wants us to be like. That is the ultimate message of this passage this morning, is that when we break the TV with the magnet, we don't need to hide from our parents, we can go up to them. When we make mistakes in our life, when we do the wrong thing, when we face temptation, God isn't saying, stay away from me. He's saying, come to me. And so this morning, if, if that's who you are, if you are feeling like you can't draw near to God, if there are things in your life, maybe you've been hurt or someone uh, has been hurt by you, I want you to remember that God does not keep you at a distance. God does not ask you to stay away. God's call to you is to draw near. Everything that we have read so far in Hebrews is leading up to this passage where the author is saying, because of everything that we have already talked about, about Jesus being greater, that means you can come all the way up to him. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with. It doesn't matter who you think you are. Jesus has open arms for you. When Jesus died on the cross and he said, it is finished, the, the curtain in the temple which separated that holy room, the holy of holies from everything else, was torn in two. And that is a symbol of how what Jesus did has, has took away every barrier between us and God. That's why we come to Jesus. That's why we trust in Jesus because he is able to remove every barrier between us and God so that when we need help, we can go before God. We can call on him. There are no hoops to jump through. There are no magic rituals that you have to do in order to make God approve of you or like you or listen to you. Every time you come to the throne of grace, even if it's the worst week of your life, even if you have done the unthinkable, if you trust in Jesus, God will look at you and all he will see is Jesus' perfect righteousness. And he will say, come on in. How can I help? What do you need? That's what God says to us this morning. That's what we want as Chapel Street Church to be right at the heart of what we do and why we love preaching the Bible, why we love putting on community programs because we want people to know that that's who God is. That even for the worst among us, which I will put my hand up and say is probably me, God welcomes us, God wants us near him. So let me go ahead and pray this morning and I, I, I wanna pray that we would get this that as we finish, we wouldn't just rush out of this building, but we would understand that God is calling us to draw near in his son. Would you guys pray with me? Father, I thank you for your son. I thank you for all of the amazing things that he's doing, things that are sometimes hard to understand, but God, things that make a real difference in our life. Thank you that he is bigger than us, that he is greater than us, that all the things that we face, they don't need a new idea, they don't need a better charismatic leader, they don't need some better form of religion, Lord, they need Jesus. He is our great high priest who has passed through the heavens, someone that we can hold fast to, that we can cling to, because he can sympathize with us, having been tempted in every way like we are, yet without sin, so God, this morning I pray that we would draw near to the throne of grace with confidence, knowing that we are welcome there, that you have more than enough mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we finish this morning, uh, we've got a little surprise, a little treat. Uh, as I said earlier, it is the first morning for the uh, Chapel Street Church Mill Creek community to gather together, and we have a really quick greeting from them that we wanted to share with you all. So we're gonna go ahead and throw that up now. Good morning, Chapel Street Church. We're so excited to be here together for our inaugural Sunday at our Mill Creek campus. Say hello from Chapel Street Church. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, yeah let's, it's good. 
It's a good moment to see that, to finally see God doing what he has promised and he's put on our hearts as a church to do for a very, very long time. So please keep praying for them this morning. Let's pray that God would do great things there. But uh, let us finish this morning with a benediction. I pray that we would all of us go today in the name of the God who became like us so that he could understand our struggles, who calls us to draw near to him in our time of need and not draw away. Let's go in his name. Amen.